He should be here too. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Let's. I didn't get any notifications from anybody that they couldn't make it, so. Hello, another. Sir. I don't see Jackie on either. Janet. Yes. Oh, there's Ann Myers on on the phone, and she says she can see all of us, but we, we can't. Um, she can see all of us, but she's not up. Is she's not going to be up? Um, I will bring her up when we talk about when we get okay. to the agenda for okay. the for the new business. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. She heard that. Okay. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Rodney. If, evening. Um, hey, Janet. I, think we're, I think we're just missing Lou. Yeah. I just emailed him. I'll give it a, a minute. I, um, I have to get everybody into the city cell phone too, so I can text you. <laughs> I haven't I haven't done that yet. We'll give him give him another minute, and hopefully he'll he'll jump in. But talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Janet, do you think uh, we should have a a uh, non private email? as well or how does that work with FOIA or you know because we're kind of I'm using my own personal email and I don't know how that works with FOIA. It's, I can touch on that yeah. a little bit. It, it's okay to use personal emails and send messages to the group. The expectation is that your your respondent group needs to be less than a quorum. So okay when if you were to send a message around to the group it, with an announcement or an idea, that's okay. Just make sure that you say, don't respond to me or respond yeah. to me separately or call okay. me. Yeah, don't don't respond as a group. Yeah. Right. I know with FOIA, there has been times when the city puts out a request that they've got a FOIA request. Does, does anybody have any emails related to X? And then we're supposed to check our emails. And if we right. have anything related, we send it in. I was just okay. thinking for it's only time. happened once that I've been on the board. Yeah, but I get a feeling we may see more of that in the future. So no, it's a it's a good reminder to to everybody. Um, so we'll just I have a separate file in my personal email just for our business. But well, right. it's good work. Yeah. Oh yeah, I have a separate folder that I just put parks and rec stuff in. Right. Okay, so I think we have everybody here now. It is 6.33, we'll call the meeting to order. Uh, the only person that I don't see is Jackie, the recording secretary. Um, she should have- Are you, you recording? Yes, yeah. <clears throat> so I'll catch up with her. She can listen to it and then the minutes, I suppose. Um, so the first item of business is approval of the meeting minutes from the March 15th, 2021 Parks and Rec meeting. Did everybody have an opportunity to take a look at that? Is there any discussion on the meeting minutes? No. Oh. Jackie, wait a minute. Okay. No discussion on the meeting minutes. Is there a motion? I move we accept them. Okay, thank you, Rodney. Second? Second. Okay, thank you, Marty. Uh, so we'll move on to 
our commissioner's reports. Um, Marty, would you like to start with what's going on in the tree business? Certainly. Um, our grant application for the West 4th Street planting project was approved. Um, Janet is in the process of uh, finalizing that, signing the contracts, et cetera. Um, and again, that involves removing nine failing trees, which will be done hopefully sooner rather than later this year. Um, there's some sidewalk work that may or may not be done after those are removed. We, we have to figure that out with streets department. And then in the fall, we'll plant 10 trees along that area. Um, for our tree city designation, we have received a little gem magnolia uh, from the state, from the state forester. We are considering where to plant it. It's a dwarf southern magnolia with small dark green foliage and a very compact narrow form. It will eventually get 20 to 25 feet tall, 10 to 15 feet wide. And it has attractive, large, white, fragrant blooms. It needs full sun. And it can't dry out too much. It needs some water. So if anybody has any ideas on where uh, we should plant that, I welcome your ideas. That sounds like a really nice tree to have someplace. Um, uh, I've done more tree tag maintenance, tree inspections, light pruning. Um, we're getting ready for Arbor Day on April 30th. Janet and I will be planting a magnolia in Zwanadale Park near where the prior large tree uh, was removed last year. Um, we got a um, yellow bird magnolia. We got the yellow bird magnolia before we got the, um, uh, uh, the uh, little gem magnolia from the state. But it, it had, has yellow flowers and it'll get 25 to 35 feet tall. I think it's gonna be really pretty in that park. Uh, but that's uh, April 30th. What time did we say, Janet? 10 o'clock? Mm -hmm. 10 o'clock, yeah. We don't have much of a, a you, know, you know, ceremony or anything. We don't really, yeah, we don't have a program. In the past years, so we've had guest speakers, but again, due to the ongoing COVID situation, we yeah. elected not to do anything formal as far as presentations. But if anybody likes to come, wants to come, that would be fun to have people there. We're still going to take pictures and put them on Facebook to show that we did something. Um, this Saturday, there's the final step in the tree steward plant training that... Um, that Janet and I took. Um, there's a tree planting in Milton that's organized by the state forester and uh, we're going and I guess there'll be more training on how to plant trees and that sort of thing. So I wanted to do that. Uh, that's all I have today. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Uh, Harry, like to talk about what's going on at George HP, you and Ed. You're, you're muted. Our theme at George H.P. Smith Park this year is going to be water. We have an abundance of water uh, pouring in from everywhere. And so as Ed and I have gone out there, there's sometimes when we do our weekly walk around or bi-weekly walk around that you need waders in some parts of the park and oh. uh, and having and having ed with me makes me more aware of how i've just been ignoring it and uh so we had a meeting with landscape with patrick and then we had a meeting with bpw and uh, the city i'll let ed talk about that one is uh, any of that affected by the current construction that's going on is that yeah, I, I, I do it. Ed, Ed, Ed's going to talk about that. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, but yeah, we're we're affected by BB's parking lot more. And what happened was Envirotech, which has come in and has done a, a, a yeoman's amount of work getting rid of all our invasives. They've taken out the poison ivy. They've taken out the English ivy. They've taken out the Chinese. Um, um, honeysuckle. Honeysuckle. Thank you. Um, but what it's made us aware of is just how much 
we lose in erosion along the banks. So just picture where the, um, the church graveyard is and they've just completely cleaned that hill off and they're mowing it now. The water coming down there, uh, when it hits the ground, it's just the ground doesn't have any absorption, it's all clay and it just runs straight down to the pond. And between the wind, between the pond being dug below the uh, water table uh, and this erosion, we didn't realize just how much we lose of the pond every year. And uh, it just falls in. And uh, the one part that we became acutely aware of is, is the real narrow part by BB Hospital's fence, which happens to be partly owned by BB Hospital. Uh, we're gonna lose, we're gonna lose pretty much the whole thing in five years if we don't do anything. So, so Ed and I have had discussions with Janet about a living shoreline, retention, what can we do? We brought Andrew in and Andrew had some great suggestions uh, about what we could do. Um, but in the meantime, we're gonna be doing less cutting of the buffer, which I know Christine has always been a, 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 an advocate of the less cutting. So we're gonna be cutting the buffer less uh, but in that area, that narrow area, we're not going we're, we're not going to cut at all uh, right now, uh, and uh, because we just and we're going to plant. Uh, Patrick is putting in plugs of some native grass that is voraciously thirsty and will do real well there. So that's that. That's how, how far we got. Ed and I. have fooled around and planted a few uh, saplings that we've dug out of the buffer. Um, and we've put them in different places to see uh, what's gonna happen. But we really do need to, next year, our budget will probably quadruple just to work on retention. Uh, besides all the fun things that we wanna do, like the, the water park and the condos. But I'll let, I'll let Ed talk about that. Is that it? Are you done, Harry? I'm, I'm way past time. <laughs> okay, and we're also, uh, sorry, Marty, we're not gonna plant your oaks right now. We're, we're gonna use that, uh, that money to, uh, for some urgent mitigation in that, in that area. So, uh, and we'll come back to them. We did plant your red buds in the same area. So um, <clears throat> what, we, what we have discovered, what I have discovered and we have talked about and discovered is the uh, interconnecting pipe from the water retention facility at the new school uh, was uh, when the penetration into the pond uh, has no formal structure and uh, it's caused uh, the water to infiltrate on the outside of the pipe seeking a level well into the park causing uh, uh, collapsing, uh, sinking, uh, so finally we got the uh, BPW and the city engineer out there and very graphically showed them uh, the extent of this continuing damage and hopefully that will stimulate some communication with the school district and uh, get them to, to address that issue. Uh, the pond uh, in the school is not tied in yet. It's not active other than rainwater water and the you know local uh, runoff, but once they tie in that that a complete facility, we're going to have massive volumes and velocity coming into Blockhouse Pond. Uh, with ad, as of right now, no no outfall structure. Uh, that was that was a big issue. Uh, also with BPW, we got them to uh, take ownership of the fact that the uh, spillway safety trash grading uh, is long gone and they need to replace it uh, expeditiously for, for safety and other reasons. So they did take ownership of that. They did take ownership of all the conveyance of the rainwater, but they, uh, they're, they're not gonna take any ownership as of now of the stormwater retention pond, which is Blockhouse Pond. Um, um, uh, so the, the undercurrent and the uh, undermining of the bank is extensive and uh, it's only going to get worse. And there's also the potential for the new sports area 
uh, that is going to be built behind the DuPont building uh, will also possibly, you know, we haven't seen the final answer on that. If they're going to be dumping that into Blockhouse Pond as well, further uh, causing more erosion. So uh, the stormwater issue in our city and at you know, all of Sussex County is, is, is critical and it's been ignored and Blockhouse Pond is an integral part of that the, the stormwater management system for the city of Lewis. So we have widened the buffer and we're not gonna cut it very much. And we're gonna do some, you know, Band-Aid kind of mitigation for right now, but the long-term uh, as a city, we have quite an issue there. So, so that's, kind of, uh, that's kind of where we are with that right now. Ed, when you say they're not gonna take ownership, who are you talking about? Uh, Darren Gordon. I haven't talked to the board yet, or we have not talked to the board yet. Although, in, in my opinion, it's, it's, uh, it's critical storm management infrastructure, which would fall under their purview, but. You're talking about the school it, district? No, no, BPW. the BPW. But also, I'd like their money. I'd like to get some of their money or some access to their money or some access to DENREC money or through, via them. They may have, you know, being uh, infrastructure rather than a park pond, we may have uh, the possibility to get more mitigating money. It, it's, it's going to be significant. May I offer another suggestion? Sure. Um, I haven't been, I mean, as a member of planning commission, this came before planning commission and we, I believe, made it clear to Davis Bowen and Friedel's design that the destruction of the pond is not an option. And especially since the construction is still happening, if the problem is already there, they need to adapt the design now before things get any worse. And I don't know whether the strategy is to contact uh, Planning Commission Chairman Drew McKay and see about having a meeting with Davis Bowen and Friedel or um, what the process would be. But if the problem is here now, it's only gonna get worse. And while the design can be changed, this is the time. I know uh, one other thing that we had said is the tree out front must be preserved. And I know for a fact, my husband has had to call, I think it's Ring Lardner, it could be Zach Crouch, I'm not sure which, which of the design, Zach, which of the, yeah. I the Zach. Zach. Mm -hmm. I, Thomas called Zach probably five times and said, there are bricks stored there, the silt fence is down, the protective fence is down, and immediately they put it back up. Um, so it does take watching, it does take reminders, and if the design isn't working now, it's not gonna get any better. So I would definitely hold up the red flag and say, this is not working. And whether that's a planning commission uh, kind of call back to say, you know, excuse me, we're having a problem or what? I would use everybody at your disposal to get their attention because I think they'll be responsive, but I think you're gonna have to ask. Yeah, and I think we have to get to the right person. And I think that's that's an excellent recommendation. It sounds like BPW ought to be dealt in on it too. Well, everybody should be at the table. Anybody and everybody who's got some sort of stake in it has to see how to make it work. But if DBF's design, if their design on its own would have been fine, that's one thing, but clearly there's a problem coming into it and their design's not gonna work. So now's the time to get everybody in the room or go out and look at it on a rainy day, especially, and say, what are we gonna do? Harry? So Drew McKay, Drew McKay may be the way to go. I, I was at the planning commission meeting when the, the pipe was for initially discussed last year. And uh, I said that parks had objected to it because they had given us the proposal too. And mm -hmm. um, we, it seemed like we were the quick fix. The pond was the quick fix. But after they presented their plan to us and the plan to the planning commission, I talked to our city engineer and he kind of buoyed me up by saying, well, you know, 
the water is going to be cleaner than the slaking water because they're going to have plants in that pond. They're going to have a living shelf. They're going to have filtration. Uh, they're going to do it right. Mm -mm. Nope. Forget all of that. They, they told us what they were going to do and they're doing something completely different that's still acceptable by DENREC. Uh, uh, but there are no plants being planted. There's no filtration going on. Well, it sounds what, like they ought to be called on that. Hmm? Well, and the thing well, is, the, the, and that the was the point of our meeting this week. <clears throat> right. Because the process and, can't be, you know, it goes through the stages and then it never comes back. There have to be loops to come back through and say, this worked really well. We'd like to see this again or, or hold on. This is not working out as intended, whether it's comes down to um, seasonal high water table, um, something done on the neighboring property that hadn't been anticipated, whatever. It's time to hold up the red flag and get everybody who uh, should be involved involved. And whether that's Darren, Drew, DBF, you, you know, obviously you all, and then say, what's happening? And, and when, Harry, in your view, if we don't do anything, we're not going to have a pond in four or five years. Well, and, and let's and let's look at their next plan that they're going to have the meeting at the beginning of the May. Um, they're building a middle school right next to the one they're storing. They're going to tear that one down and build a rumors has it a three story middle school. They are going to then after that use every piece of Cape available land for sports fields. Now, they're not doing it for the middle school. Middle schools do not need extensive amounts of sports fields. I mean, I was a middle school teacher. You can, you don't need a lot. And they're planning it as if they're going to be holding tournaments. They're planning it as if they're going to be having a lacrosse tournament and they'll have four fields available. No parking, of course, but four fields available. And it, it just, it just boggles my mind that at the other middle schools that they have built, there's nowhere near this kind of for, sports being, being contemplated. And they're doing it here and half of it is going to go into Canary Creek, the stormwater, and the other half is going to go into Blockhouse Pond. And uh, with what we've seen with this pipe, they, they promised us a, a valve at the end point. And the city engineer said, well, they talked about that, but they just put some rocks in instead. <laughs> and if you walk by this pipe right now, we, matter of fact, we, we showed this to Andrew. It's sunk. There's two foot holes on both sides of this pipe. So if he's running along with his mowers or somebody is walking in the field, they're going to they're gonna fall in a gopher hole. I mean, they're going to lose the horse and the wagon. And it's, it's a mess. Rodney, I have a question. Is 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 it not functioning because they didn't carry out the design as it was represented, or is it because they're not finished? Well, that was my question, Rodney. If they were finished, if this was their end product, or are you going to come back to it, or right. and and you know we're waiting on those answers. Okay, but. Initially, can I, can I just ask I what the raised, next step to the meeting was? What was the <laughs> end result of the meeting and what was the next meeting that was planned? They, Janet can speak to that maybe. I, I think um, with regard to that pipe, um, Charlie was going to reach out to, I believe, um, DBF and address it with them and see where they were at. So hopefully we should be getting an answer from Charlie shortly. With regard to the spillway, PW did agree that they would replace the grate that was removed because it was basically deteriorating and was tossed to the side. They put up a temporary fence, which you can literally climb around and stand on top of the concrete and fish off of there, but it's a safety issue if children, you know, do that. So they've agreed to do that. So we're just following up that, you know, it gets done and keeping it on the radar, but Charlie was going to reach out to, on the, the pipe issue. 
Well, Char Charlie already told me that they took the plants off the table. And then I, I got right. a, then then BPW was telling me how they're going to have two ponds, and the first pond will all the the residues will fall into the first pond, and then arrive at the second pond all happy and clean. Well, there's only one pond. There's there's no evidence that they have made two ponds where the first one is going to act as a, a heavy filtration unit. Uh, so it seems to me that they are probably still following. Denrex re minimum requirements, but um, I, the first I, pond, the first pond is going to be behind the current shields, so it's not there yet. All right, there are multiple ponds in there, but we're we're kind of getting off track here. We, I just want to address the issue that we currently have in George H. P. Smith Park in relation to the current retention pond that is under construction. The connection to Blockhouse Pond. There are serious issues with it right now. And I don't want to get ahead of ourselves with all the, the next round of water that's going to come into Blockhouse Pond. But if this is in any indication of how they're going to proceed, we have a serious problem. And as a park commissioner, I don't carry much weight. So I've been pursuing this for, for, for a while now. And, and we finally did get a a response and and they actually came out and looked at it the engineer and and darren gordon and i just hope that it wasn't just lip service and uh but you got to be a squeaky wheel so here i, I appreciate am. that i appreciate it i yeah. appreciate your diligence on this and we'll I, uh, the attention that you've brought to it thank you andrew so any any other questions or comments for ed or harry we meet this week with uh, the farmers market folks to uh, to right. for our plan for this current the upcoming year. That's it. Okay. Thank you, uh, Warren. You want to give us a report on 1812 and Mary Vessels? Sure. Uh, 1812. Uh, the uh, Patrons planted uh, 100 day lilies this week on the uh, canal side of the fence between the daffodils. The object being to provide some color there in the summer and also as they grow to hide the daffodil foliage as it uh, wilts down every uh, spring after they bloom. Also, uh, Janet, myself, Cindy DiMedio, who's the LIB head patron of 1812 Park met with Randy Burton, who owns the house that is adjacent to the park. And we talked about some improvements that Randy would like to see made into the made in the park. And uh, I guess there's going to be further discussion of that. And if all goes well, uh, Randy said he's willing to contribute some bucks to that. So I guess that's uh, going to be looked at in the future. Uh, as far as Mary Vessels Park is concerned, uh, the patrons have been cleaning up there weekly or bi-weekly. The magnolia trees have started to drop their leaves as usual. And uh, I told them that uh, the patrons that they get a dollar a week leaf from the city for each one they collect, but I haven't seen that money yet. <laughs> be a million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have to get that bench replaced, Warren, so they have a place to sit and rest after they pick up all those leaves. Yeah. <laughs> so, and some of the issues with the um, 1812 park were just um, looking, uh, Randy was looking at the original plans that Rodney, you had drawn up and wanting to maintain the integrity of those original plans that the previous owner, you know, was, was um, very, very focused in keeping the integrity. So some of the things are just maintenance, like replacing some of the gravel around the um, cannons. It gets kicked around as people you know climb on them so no 
nothing major, just kind of going back and looking at the original plans and maintaining the integrity of, of those plans. So thank you, Warren. Does anybody <coughs> have any questions or comments for Warren? Yes, Ed. I, I just want to thank uh, Lewis and Bloom the tulips were fantastic this year. It was just, our whole city is so beautiful. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. They really That's did great. a magnificent job. That's mm -hmm. great. The weather cooperated. It <laughs> did. We had two weekends of tulips. We had that 80 degree day, which was worth like a week of normal weather. And then once they started to bloom, it's been relatively cool. So we had a long blooming season. We don't want too much of that hot weather too soon. No. <laughs> okay, so we'll move to Stango Park and Stango Extended, Candace and Christine. Christine will kick it off. She's got okay. the part. Yeah. All right. Well, um, good news. The holly trees from Second Street that were donated by Lewis and Bloom got planted last week. Uh, by Patrick and uh, they're, they look wonderful, really nice. Thank you, Lewis and Bloom for uh, the donation. Uh, we also planted a few more over by the culvert um, that uh, um, I think Marty had recommended. We plant a few over there. So that was uh, an addition to uh, what we planted along the trailhead. Um, and Patrick Olson's crew also removed several um, expired trees and shrubs from the library area that's kind of adjacent to the children's courtyard area. And um, while we were, um, unfortunately had a, several trees that had to, and shrubs that had to be removed, but it, um, we're getting that cleaned up so that um, possibly the um, library is proposing to do um, a program in conjunction with um, an organization called Roots and Shoots. And these kids want to take over the courtyard area and um, do some educational uh, gardening and planting in that area. So the courtyard uh, is going to be uh, used for uh, planting and educational purposes, which I think um, Candace and I both agree is a a good use of that area. So um, that's it. That's all I have for uh, my portion of the report. Candace. Okay. <clears throat> On uh, March 12th, uh, Christine and I met with uh, Warren and Ed Zygmanski, uh adjacent to the Children's Learning Garden. Um, the bed that was between is now been cleaned out. I'll explain more. Uh, between the Children's Learning Garden and Kings Highway. Um, they were proposing that the shrubbery there was too overgrown and that it be removed and then some other plants be placed there um, at the uh, expense of Lewis and Bloom and the Children's Learning Garden. They were collaborating on that. And they also uh, paid for the removal of the shrubs that were there. So it's cleared out now. It's ready for planting. And it also means that the vegetables in the Children's Learning Garden will finally get some sun because uh, those plants face west. And so, you know, in the afternoons between the other trees that surround the children's learning garden, uh, there wasn't a lot of sun to be had for their vegetable garden. So now um, this will enable uh, shorter plant material to be put in that location. And uh, we're looking forward to color, I think. Right, Warren? That's correct. Yeah. So pretty, is very exciting collaboration. We so appreciate the support of Lewis and Bloom and the Children's Learning Garden for this project. And uh, now the, the planting, it's ready for planting. Well, we still have to remove the sod and connect the two beds. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, there's some electrical just below those, that connection with those two beds. So you gotta be careful there. Um, the paint that was put down by the BBW to mark the utilities is uh, worn off. So. Uh, but you can see the meter and the line goes to the other bed. So I think it should be all set. Yeah. And that's all I have. Thank you. And we'll move over to Kay and the beaches. Any report? I know it's, uh, I think, I think your really busy season is coming too, along with everybody else's. <laughs> I think, I think so. Um, I've been spending as much time as I can there. Uh, the snow fence is down. 
Um, there are two benches of beach one that will need to be replaced. Um, they've been uh, removed, it's all been marked off. Um, the sand has been moved at the beach one entrance that was really blocking it. And there was a great deal of sand in front of the homes at Debrac Preserve that has also been moved so that they can actually find their driveways because it was completely full. It was a lot of sand. Um, something that I've observed is I think I'm going to need to develop some sort of um, beach manners or beach courtesy signs so we don't have a bunch of do not. And I'd love to know who it is. I can't catch them. I know they're there before seven. They put out every day a ton of bread crusts. Oh, and there wow. were two, probably 30 meter wide hearts of bread crust. I don't know whether somebody who works overnight at a bakery, I have no idea who it is, but I've been there at seven and it's already there. And there was a ton of it there yesterday. And I mean, it's wrong for a number of reasons, but especially because I have to say the patrons at the beaches are excellent um, with social distancing. And every bit of the beach is being used by people. Uh, three years ago, on a day like yesterday, everyone would have been up at the water. But as it was, everyone was all over all of the available area. So I need to come up with some sort of positive way to say, these are the things you do. Uh, please don't climb the dune to, you know, take your dog up there. Uh, you know, curb your dog properly. Um, I saw that yesterday. I saw people climbing the dunes for photos, a uh, number of things like that. So I need to come up with a positive way to um, tell people to behave. So I need to work on that a bit. Um, I will miss the May meeting, but in June, um, I would like to have on the agenda um, um, what I've been considering for the naming process for the two beaches and uh, present that to Parks and Rec for comment. So that would be at our June meeting. And I think that is what I've got. Thank you. Thank you, Kay. I, I just wanted to mention too, and you and I had talked about this a little bit when you first came on board, there was a woman, um, a resident in the city who had um, suggested some signage about the, um, the wildlife, the birds, um, specifically the horseshoe crabs that frequently yes. get mishandled. And yes. that might be a good opportunity to um, loop in why it's, um, not good to put those breadcrumbs out and feed the seagulls. Um, and I think it because what we talked about with signage was it being educational versus a don't do this and don't do that. So yes. we can we can connect with her. Um, we'll we'll look and see if there's any kind of um, funding source through grants or whatnot from Denrec. And um, I have some samples too of of signage that has been in other uh, parks and locations. So I think that would be a good way to kind of don't feed the seagulls. <laughs> yeah, exactly. it, it, goes, it goes beyond the gulls because of course there are deer, right. raccoon, rabbits, right. there's all kinds of things that are there. Fox, and what, yeah. the, what the snack shack doesn't need are rodents coming to you know eat the Absolutely. food that's left there. And then move into their structure. So right. we really don't want that either. But um, I, I just need to come up with a positive tone. And you know, I was sort of thinking earlier about having um, enlisting a children's class to come up with some of the signs through their artwork. And because wow. you know, once you you know, when you approach kids and um, it starts young, um, I think that's a nice way to involve you know, if you have kids make signs and we can put them out there, that could be a nice way to make people pay attention. Mm -hmm. And um, you take ownership then. So I'll, I'll be working on that. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I helped plant some of that seagrass. So I have a, I have a vested interest in, in keeping it safe. But um, yeah. I, I have seen signs on 
what seagrass does and why you don't want to interfere with it and how it holds the dune and protects the beach and yada yada. So yeah, I think there might be signs already available through Denrec or something they've already designed. Well, what happens is the fence does not go 100% of the way. So wherever the fence isn't, that's where people walk up. The access right. point, yeah. Is there a way yeah. we can extend the fence, get this fence extended? Well, right now it's where the sand that is scraped from the parking lot is pushed up. So that's, I mean, I don't think it could hurt to bury the fence permanently and just put up more fence because it would just secure the dune. So we just have to, I, I think, talk to the streets department about how that is handled. And, and I think Denrec, Mike Powell, um, to find out about uh, the best way to prop the dune, organize the fence so it helps the dune grow and keeps people where people should be. Or if there's a if there's a movable fence, they can move aside when they're moving sand around and then put it back in place. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, but, agreed. Uh, agreed. There has uh, to be a solution. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to mention that the um the Afri on the naming of the beaches the. Uh, African American Heritage has a project of naming uh, honorary namings throughout Lewis, and I think Beach Two was one that they were looking at. So you might want to coordinate potentially mm -hmm. with Trina or, or someone from that committee. That's well, and that was my idea. I wanted Great. to present that to the group because, um, you know, I, honestly, I was thinking Savannah Beach for the main beach because that makes sense, but then use Beach Two as an opportunity to honor someone and explain because people always say why is this beach here i don't know but i love it and you know tell people why is it there and so i think that's a good opportunity to do that so that's what i'm hoping to do then is after our june meeting get everybody's comments and if everybody says go ahead then ask to be on the july agenda for um african-american heritage commission and then move forward with that i think it, it would be fun and interesting and um, a nice, you know, co-project that we could do. And then we'd have um, perhaps a plaque or some sort of maybe even larger sign sort of like that's at uh, the Zwanendale, maybe talking about Menhaden and the net reel and all of that there as well. We'll see, we'll see what everybody's response is, but I think that's perfect. That's perfect. Rodney? Who's responsible for putting up the snow fencing uh, on the beach during the winter time in the fall and then removing the street, it? The, the streets the department. Streets mm -hmm. Yeah, maintenance, the streets department. Is that where the sand is coming from that's accumulating? It Primarily, accumulates. it's, yeah. Go it, ahead, Kay. It accumulates right there, yeah. So would, would additional fencing help that? Well, there was discussion about this is the this is the fence that is parallel to the shoreline right. that the city puts up to help, to help retain it there from being blown into the parking lot, right. and that does a good job. Um, but then once it's really the season now, this the it's taken down. And m my concern is the we've had so much onshore wind over this winter that truly there had to be ten feet of sand in front of those homes. Right. It, it was a monumental task to get it out of there. And then um, the main dune needs to be preserved. And I, it's going to take something from Denrec as far as whether it's going to need snow fencing on top or how it's done in order to have the sand drop onto the dune. Right. Um, that's gonna take a Mike Powell discussion, I think. Um, so I, I need to coordinate a, a plan with them uh monitoring and ideas because shortly they're going to put up the weather station and then after that i'd like to talk to mike powell about a one-year plan five-year plan for that preserving that june okay thank you are there any other questions for k okay thank you k thank you. um rodney can you going yes, on a um, canal front well canal front park uh um distinctive landscapes removed the three dead and um declining river birch 
um, and ground the stumps down and put down topsoil and they're going to <clears throat> replace uh, them with sod. Uh, and Patrick had suggested, which I thought was an excellent idea, um, rather than putting the trees out on the margin in the grass to actually move them into the large uh, herbaceous bed uh, where they would actually probably do much better uh, because there'd be more moisture there. And uh, so I went and staked them out and I spaced them farther apart because uh, tupelos or black gums, uh, whatever you want to call them, um, once they get established and start growing, they can get a very uh, become a very large tree with a broad head. And so they need room to spread out. And um, the, most of the trees, almost all of them that are in the park are planted quite, quite close together. Uh, that, is the, that is the style, I would say, of, of Andropogon, um, the, uh, the firm that uh, did the original design. I've known them for years, for 40 years. Um, and they, they tend to plant things very close together. I think in this case, uh, it was a, it'll be an improvement to get a little more air between the trees. So that's what we did. And, and uh, then they won't have to mulch and cut with a mower around uh, the tree, which was uh, really getting, getting to be narrow little strips of grass. So we, we made an improvement there, I think, that in time will, uh, will, will really help. Um, and in time, I expect the other river birches will succumb also because I think it's too salty of an environment for them. Um, and when they, by the time we take them down, perhaps the tupelos will be big enough to stand on their own and give us trees in that area. So we'll see. Um, I know Patrick is, if he hasn't done already, he's getting ready to uh, plumb the, uh, the containers that Lewis and Bloom uh, donated. Uh, out under the arbor and the pergola, they're they're all going to be uh, irrigated, um, and I and I think that's all been approved, and um, it may have already been done. I'm not sure. Uh, Warren, you might you might yet. know better. Pardon me. Has not been done yet. Not been done. Okay, Patrick told me it's it's on the list, um, and you know he's had. I I, I would just say in passing that he as every contractor I talk to has a huge problem getting labor, finding labor. Yes. Um, people don't want to work uh, or for whatever reason, there's okay. a lot of work out there and every, every contra landscape contractor I talk to, it's a struggle. It really is. So I'm inclined to um, be a little, little generous and, um, uh, with uh, expectations, because I know he's he's trying his hardest, but it doesn't always get done when we want. So, um, and I know when when is the art is the art still the uh, artwork still? Um, it, go ahead, Janet. It it did go in this weekend. It, the oh. art installation was installed. Okay, um, I oh, went by. Oh, I went by the park this morning. I was there Saturday for a little bit. I went by this morning and it's completed. Um, there, they, The Public Art Committee does have signs, um, two signs. They were placed in the grass, um, which would make it difficult for the landscapers, for Patrick's crew to come around and mow. So I talked to Cliff about it today and he's going to move them into, I said, just put them right in the margin of, you know, the soil from that garden. Um, so he said he would take care of that. Um, but I think everything, as far as I know, everything went well. Um, and I, Rod or Barry, if you have any other I don't know if you uh, were down there this weekend too. I was there four or five times. I, I helped unload the truck with a rock. Oh because the uh the crew from Rise Gym never materialized. So mm. a number of us actually carried rocks. <laughs> anyway, um yeah it was uh we allotted two days or I, I, I'm sorry, three days to complete the project. Uh, and it really only took two days. So she was finished 
um, by Sunday night. And um, it was a very interesting uh, project. A lot of people in the park, uh, especially Saturday, asking a lot of questions, wanting to know about it. Um, sometime in, uh, around noontime, I think we got the signs up. The signs that identify the sculpture have a QR code on it so you can take your phone and read more about the sculpture and the artist and it takes them right to the website. Uh, and we do have a small barrier around it. It may need to be a, a little bit larger, a little bit higher. And um, we're going to put signs up. In fact, um, Cliff just asked me about um, what to put on the sign that wasn't negative. And um, we came, I came up with something like, um, please, for your safety, please enjoy the art from behind the barrier. Mm. Um, the, the rock is obsidian, igneous rock. So it's very sharp. It's kind of like volcanic rock. So, I mean, you could cut your hand. Uh, plus we don't want people climbing on it. Um, most of the rocks are attached or tethered to a structure. Um, so they, they shouldn't go anywhere, but there, there's, there's probably a few loose rocks in there. So um, we just want to discourage that. So, but I, I think it's an exciting project. I think, I, I think it's a much more contemplative uh, sculpture than we had uh, chosen for last year. I think there's going to be a, a lot more people, you know, contemplating what is it? What does it mean to me? What does it mean to, to Lewis? Is there a nautical theme here? How does it relate to the maritime industry that was here or whatever? So um, I, I'm really excited about it. And, you know, it's our first really big, big project with yeah. our committee. Well, thank you. I, I wasn't able to be there. I was out of town, but... Um... Okay. It'll be there until the middle of September. <laughs> What's that? Until September? Middle of September. So. Okay. All right. Did you I have a... this morning, and okay. I was pleasantly surprised. Um, Good. After, after looking at the the picture, I did not think I would like it, but I think it fits in very well. I I I was impressed. We're also going to have like art talks, like like once a month, somebody's going to sort of, you know, shepherd some kind of discussion at at the sculpture about what it means to you or what do you see in it or whatever. Uh, we don't quite have the dates or have that all together yet, but that's something that we're planning anyway. Will that be a Zoom or live? Do you think or? Face to face. We were anticipating doing something live, but I mean, because, you know, people are in the park with masks anyway. So right. um, I think you almost have to be there because I have had a couple of people that weren't too impressed with the pictures, uh, like uh, Warren said, and the pictures really don't do it justice. You really have to see it. So, so go see it, everyone. Yes. Thank you. Should I go into the rest of my report? Sure. sure. <laughs> yep. Recreation and yes. Well, the public art projects are the most exciting thing. Uh, the tennis courts were in the process of resurfacing the tennis courts. Um, Janet and the engineer checked out the synthetic service that was chosen uh, down in Ocean City. And when I was in Florida, I checked out a couple of synthetic surfaces. Um, we chose the synthetic surface to uh, uh, recover the quartz because of the maintenance and because of its resistance to cracks. And that's a big problem uh, with the tennis courts. Uh, we did have some questions about um, the surface from pickleballers um, because it the ball bounces differently or whatever. However, um, the same sort of surface was used for the Australian Open um, for tennis. So, 
you know, if it's good enough for the Australian Open, I think it's good enough for Lewis. <laughs> so, um, uh, can I ask a question, Barry? That's going to be yeah. on the twenty sixth. The agenda. The council has a special meeting. So, okay. well, yeah. I, I mean, with tennis, there's uh, there's tournaments on clay, synthetic surfaces, and uh, you know the blacktop surfaces. And so. Great. And grass. There's four or five different surfaces that the sport is played on and that are sanctioned by the sport. So, I mean, and I always say, keep in mind they're tennis courts. So we're going to build them to uh, tennis specs in the hopes of accommodating pickleballers, of course, but that's kind of how they ought to be built. Um, but Andrew knows more about the Right. Rodney? Rodney. Yeah, in my in my experience um, during my practice, you you often have to factor in: is it a new surface on a new blacktop, or are you resurfacing an existing system that has cracks in it, like our tennis courts do? And those cracks can really change the dynamics of uh, of the thing. So I don't know anything specifically about this surface. Um, but you want to make sure that it adheres properly everywhere and you don't get bubbles or spaces where right. you get a different adherence and therefore you do get a different response from the ball. Yeah, that, that was mentioned that sometimes okay. you get pockets. Yes. So Janet, I, the other thing I was going to do, I, I was going to, it sounds like you already reached out to Brad Dennehy at the at Milford Parks and Rec. I did, yeah. Do they have yeah. it installed already or not? It's so yeah, here's, uh, we had a, an interesting conversation. They were, they're resurfacing. They basically rebuilt their basketball courts and they were gonna be resurfacing the basketball courts with the premier system. Um, they were up against the weather in the fall because you have to have it a certain temperature to right. lay the surface down. So they were going to do a temporary striping of the basketball courts and then come and resurface in when the weather was warmer. They haven't actually had the surface put down yet. So he wasn't able to give me much feedback any feedback actually. Um, we're trying to schedule another meeting with the folks down in Ocean City. They have several courts that Anne Marie and I and um, Vince and Charlie went and looked at. Um, but I, I think that since there has been some feedback from I think primarily the pickleball players, we wanted to ask some more specific questions of them down in Ocean City. And I'm, I'm trying to find out if any other municipalities, you know, kind of a little bit more locally have had any experience with it so that we can ask some questions and get some more feedback. Yeah, and a critical question is, is it a resurface or is it a new surface on a new court? Right, right. Yeah. That's a critical question to ask. Okay, right. that's okay. I mean, we could address cracks right. in our current situation by ripping the whole thing up and starting over, but right. I don't think we're going to do that. I, I mean, think that the, the plan for our resurfacing is that the cracks would be filled and then and the surface- And bridged. They have to be bridged, you know, with a fabric. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, then, and then the- uh, the premier surface laid over. Okay. Um, but that, but that's a good question. Yeah, definitely. Is there anything? Yeah, the success yeah. of any surfacing, no matter if it's, it's a floor or roadway or anything, is that the subsurface is the key to success. So Amen. Yes, that's in Amen. anything you do. We did see um, in Ocean City the basketball court had in the high traffic lane in the key, um, there was some damage to the surface. Um, 
what we were told was that, you know, how did it get that far that the, the scenes were pulling apart, um, that when it was seen, it wasn't reported so that they could get it repaired right away and it just continually broke down. Um, so, so there is, you know, some, some, you have to, if you see a flaw in it, we have mm -hmm. to address it right away with the company. Right. So. The other thing I wanted to add was that uh, a couple of weeks ago when uh, we had that wonderfully warm couple of warm days, <clears throat> I was down at the basketball court at about four o'clock. I counted 35 people in that court. Really? Uh, yes, I did. There were young wow. people. There were 10, 10 playing actively. And whenever they would go down to one basket, a bunch would run out and shoot in the basket that was free and then scamper off when the game came back. There were 10 waiting to go after the first game was over and there were another 10 waiting to go after they were done and a few people sitting around just watching. So it was, it was 35 people there in a beautiful, wow. room, which that's, I had no idea. That's great. That's like great. We need another basketball court. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that'll be, that'll be the next no subcommittee, comment. right? Yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, Okay. Just a couple other quick things. Um, Great Marsh Park, we have not made uh, any progress this month on that. Uh, we were supposed to meet uh, with Eric Berkentine of Forest Service, and he was unable to meet with us because of controlled burning in the area. And um, so hopefully we'll schedule that um, sometime in May. Um, as far as the other playgrounds, they're all in pretty good order. Um, I do think that in the next um, three to four years, um, we may have to think about replacing the playground in uh, Canal Front Park, um, but that's something we can talk about. Um, and then um, I just talked with Janet about um, maybe starting the second phase um, for Smith Park for um, the uh, to add the swings and the pavilion for that uh, play, new playground structure that we that we put up just a, uh, recently. So, Eric, could you repeat the time frame you said on replacement of the playground? I, I'm saying three or four years, and that's 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 my estimate. Um, so th th there's no. There are... Since I came on board, there have been a couple of issues with pieces of the structure coming apart. I was able to speak with um, the maintenance department and they've been able to repair them. But um, Allison is a certified playground inspector um, and she will, I know it's impressive. Isn't oh, it? that's right. She went to that. Uh... She, yes, yeah. Oh. So um, she actually did say to me um, with this last replacement and fix that they're doing that it's, it's going to be time soon to take a look at that. And um, we did have inspectors come when we mm -hmm. replaced the other one. Right, right. And they looked at, at um, that playground also. And that okay. report might be somewhere. I don't know. Um, I'll see if I can find it, but we can have Allison do another one. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'll ask her, please. Um, it's good, good to have on board. So we'll keep that on our radar. Is there anything else, Barry? Oh, that's all. I'll, okay. I'll be quiet now. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, Lou is sitting patiently. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> I thought I'd never get up, uh, but uh, well, this was with a, everything a going on, full, full um, meeting, full reports this week. This yeah, let, let's uh, let's start with Swandell Park. Um, I had several uh, work parties uh, take place there, primarily to get the uh, park uh, ready for the Tula Festival. And um, I want to reiterate what Warren said. Uh, I think the tulip blooms this year and the flowers were probably the most spectacular I've seen for a long time. And the reason being that um, they in my park anyhow, they, they all pretty much came on time. And then they also lasted another two weeks uh, because of the cooler weather. 
And, and again, what I have in my park, but even added a lot more to the color, is I have a, a, a lot of daffodils spread out throughout the park. I have hyacinths, and then I've uh, also added a lot of uh, winter pansies. So it was a pretty spectacular uh, flower display during that whole uh, festival itself. I cleaned the fountain basin uh, and, and finally got the uh, fountain out of storage and I connected it up with the uh, electricity and the water lines and all that, but then found a major problem. The uh, water spigot itself was just, when I turned it on, it was just spraying water all over the place. So we had to, I had to turn it off real quick. And uh, so Allison and the uh, maintenance department are going to go ahead and, and uh, replace that. And so I should have that running as soon as they get the uh, spigot uh, actually uh, repaired. Um, our annual tool dig is scheduled for April the 27th. Um, and I have a, quite a few of uh, those in bloom uh, patrons that are going to help me supervise that dig. Uh, especially, uh, it's important to, uh, that we make sure that people don't get started early. Uh, we've had that problem in the past and uh, where they actually ended up, ended up digging a lot of really the, the nicer tulips. And then there was one year where actually when someone came at nine o'clock, there was just nothing there. And so it was, it's, it's important that, uh, that they, they do everything on time. Um, then, uh, and I, I'm also, I usually have them also because I want to make sure the beds don't get all trampled down and then um, the pansies and so forth and so on. So it's, it's important to have some of the supervised and the last thing I have is the uh, spring annuals that I have ordered are going to arrive the uh, first week in May. And so I'll be starting to plant those uh, hopefully a few days after that. And then on the uh, Lewis Community Guard, we, we uh, continue to do a lot. The, the, uh, that, that group is really uh, ambitious and uh, there's a lot of things happening. We had uh, 29 returning gardeners uh, that, that came back this year. And then we also added another 13 new gardeners that were chosen by the lottery. So we still, but we still have a, a waiting list, but it's down now to about five, but I, I'm sure that's going to build up. So there's just been a lot of, a lot of interest in that community garden. Um, we held several information sessions uh, to, uh, for all the returning gardeners uh, with some new rules. And then we also had the uh, new gardeners uh, indoctrinated also with the, uh, the latest uh, of how they really uh, do organic gardening, things like that. Uh, we're planning to have a, have a fundraising event at the uh, Dogfish, Dogfish Head Brewing and Eats restaurant in, on April the uh, 29th. I, I wrote and submitted a grant application for the uh, Festival of Cheers, and I hope to hear something by the end of the month on that. The Delaware Nature Society uh, referred two individuals to us um, we're starting a native plant nursery, and they wanted to uh, build a demo in our uh, in our um, garden, uh, a pollinator garden, on our grounds. And since this was part of really our, our future ambitions, anyhow, uh, we the board went ahead and unanimously approved that request. So uh, that's going to save us some money just having that put in. And um, we. Um, Purchase two A-frame uh, picnic tables that will be used for educational events and also uh, as resting stations. The spring planting has, has really uh, gotten started in a big, big way. And many of our beds are now planted with the cold weather crops. And their first work day was held, uh, our big work day, that's what that way, was held on April the 17th, uh, both in the morning and afternoon uh, to help out with a lot of chores that we're, uh, we have to do out there. Uh, and the last thing is um, I uh, got a revised estimate back on the, our permanent deer fence. Um, and the quote was for $14,000. Um, and this is a deer fence that's similar to the one put around the uh, botanical gardens. So it's, a, it's a really a Cadillac type of a fence. Um, and we have ample funds applied uh, available to build the fence. So it's just a matter of us now going ahead and deciding if we want to go, well, if we're pretty much decided we're going to go ahead. And so, uh, but we hasn't been approved by the board yet, but uh, we'll probably get that started uh, after the growing season in late fall. And that, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions for Lou? Okay. Um, uh, uh, Lou, I, I, um, I missed who is actually building the demo garden. Who's doing that? What's that? 
Who is building the demo, the demonstration garden? The, uh, the the one the one that's going to do it. I, I don't have the name of the uh, the group. Okay, that's, uh, it's it's a like I said, there are a, a new there are a couple that are starting up a new business, and I don't I don't have their name. So it's a it's a commercial business enterprise that's building a demo garden. They're going to build it. They're going to build there. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I have some questions about having a commercial business building up a demo garden on that property. If it's going to be used to for their commercial enterprise, um, I wonder about that. Uh, yeah, I, I could I could look into it, uh, but it was they were uh, they're involved with the, the, the involved with the Delaware Nature Society. They're involved, they're involved with the Delaware Nature Society, so I'm, I'm not too sure about uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I don't. I would like more information on what it's going to be used for because I don't think we could use the park for commercial enterprises. Um, if it was part of the Nature Society or, you know, Native Plant yeah. Society, something like that, yeah. uh, that the Native Plant Society is using for education, that sort of thing, that's probably fine. But I'm just wondering if it's a commercial enterprise doing it for commercial purposes, then I'd wonder about it. Okay, I, I could find out more about yeah. that. Yeah, we need more information. Yeah, thank you. thank you, Marty. Yeah, if you could get more information, Lou, that would be great. Okay. Hey, Lou, uh, what is the official start time for digging the tulips? Uh, eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, usually, um, I'll, I'll be down there at like seven. Uh, yeah. What day is that? The twenty seventh. Sounds like it'll be under moonlight. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I've been to them. You, you need to really. Oh my God, sharp yeah, elbows! It, it gets wild. It gets wild. People go and scope out where their favorite colored tulip is to make sure they get what they want. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Lou, That's we a lot did of fun. The night before, unfortunately. We did mm -hmm. do a uh, press release for uh, the tulip dig, and I did put in there to you know be mindful of the start time. I've had a couple of phone calls from people asking when it's going to be and when does it start and be mindful of the start time. So um, good luck with, with policing that. I know it's a- uh, We shouldn't be doing press. It's like the Easter egg hunt. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, if, it, if it's anything like the uh, surf fishing <clears throat> tags, they'll be camping out the night before. <laughs> you have a lottery. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I just wanted to go back for a moment because we did have someone in the chat, um, Lori Carter, when we were discussing the uh, pickleball courts and the restriping and resurfacing. She said that she's the girls tennis coach at Cape and can comment about courts and maintenance. It's very important to know the level of use um, and it can be very expensive if not done correctly. So. Um, thank you for that, Lori. Um, ah, wait, I just hit a wrong button. Okay. So, no, why? There you all are. No, I keep losing you. Um, so, that's all of our commissioner reports. Um, Rodney, was there anything that you wanted to add? Anything from Friends of Canal Front Park? No, I haven't heard from them. Okay. Um, so we'll check in again next month. So we can move on to agenda item D1 under old business. Um, this is the presentation, discussion, and possible action on the draft policy for um, signage for donations to park and recreation department. Um, a little history on this back at the December 21st, 2020 meeting, there was a request from Warren um, to have a discussion on the possibility of sponsorship for um, Lewis and Bloom, particularly at uh, Stango Park, um, to help support them with plantings in the park. Um, and it had come up several times in the past um, and 
no decision was made. So we formed the committee to um, look at what we had in place and um, what we needed to add to. And um, I am going to um, ask Candace to kind of review and how we got to where we are um, with the draft policy and then open it up for discussion. So the draft policy that you can get access to on the city's website that's part of tonight's agenda uh, was formulated uh, with the committee in the course of our discussion. Um, a couple of the points that I'd like to make is that the, the draft policy before you is an attempt to stay consistent with other city policies that are already on the books. So for example, where there is a policy about donating trees, donating benches and other items to the city, um, the language that you will see here um, is very similar to that. In some cases, it's identical to those policies that are already on the books so that we wouldn't have conflicting city policies talking about signage in the parks and discussing it in a manner that was not consistent with how it's approached for other donated items or other donations to the city. So um, there's an amount here that uh, gives a signage threshold, but I will say that within the policy, it gives flexibility to the city to determine what types of signage are actually placed in the parks and when um, the acknowledgement that is provided to a donor at every level, um, any donation would be acknowledged. Um, it's just a question of, you know, the, the larger donations become eligible for signage in the park, but every donation that comes to the city in this policy would be acknowledged by, uh, the, by the city through a letter uh, mention on the website and other, other things that are available to the city to acknowledge. So I'll turn it back to Janet and we can. Okay. So, yes, I had um, sent out to the committee um, some sample letters and certificates that have been given in the past for um, donations of trees or benches. Um, so have you all had an opportunity to look at the draft policy and are there comments? suggestions, questions? I just had a question around the, the, the amount, the $1,500, is, is there a formula in terms of like what that gets Lewis and Bloom, for example, or a, a tree, a certain number of flowers, et cetera? Well, I'll let Warren talk to that from Lewis and Bloom's perspective, but the tree policy has set amounts for what it takes to procure a tree. So that, go ahead, Warren. It's my understanding it doesn't get Lewis and Bloom anything initially. It gets it. It goes into the Parks and Rec uh, for that park, and Lewis and Bloom or someone else would have an opportunity to use those funds for the betterment of the park. I mean, my concern is I'm just. I'm curious about the, the amount of the $1,500. I mean, what is there? Well, I, I can I can talk about the amount as relates to a tree. Right now, our, our tree policy, uh, donation po policy says $1,000 if you want to donate a tree. Um, from what I can see, what I've gathered, um, it's basically uh, a reasonable cost for procuring a tree, your, you know, some average sort of tree, plus several years of maintaining the tree. So um, that's where it comes from. If you want a plaque, it's another amount on top of that to buy a plaque. Uh, right. Um, and, and as far as the draft policy, the $1,500 I surveyed, a lot of communities across the country to see what their policies were in profiles of funding and acknowledgement. And so, uh, as I said, everyone would be acknowledged, but the question of whether there is a sign that goes in there dedicated to that support of a specific park, we felt that there had to be a, a, 
a reasonable threshold of how much money was being donated to the park by the donor before um, we had lots of signage. And we also wanted to avoid having uh, a plethora of signs everywhere, uh, basically detracting from the beauty of the parks. So the concern was the city has control over what the signage looks like, A, and B, that they are limited to a certain threshold of giving so that it's not just a $100 donation doesn't get you a sign. A $500 do donation doesn't get you a sign, et cetera, because then we'd have, you know, it populated with waving signs or whatever format they were, but we probably have more signs than plants. I have a threshold question, and that is, um, what, what is the need? I mean, we've done some extraordinary things in the city. We've had a lot of things donated uh, without putting any signs up. Uh, we just had some extraordinary donations that helped us put in the first phase of the playground in GHP. Um, and, and, and what is the perceived need to even have this policy to start with? That's where I'd like to start. Well, I, I think it, it originally started with the request from Warren to have the sponsorship to allow Lewis and Bloom to have sponsorship for planting. And then right, let's, let's, let's back up another step. What is it that Lewis and Bloom or a park commission or anybody wants to do that they can't do yet because what they've asked mayor and city council for the money and they've been denied or whatever the rationale is. I, I'm not aware of any request to the mayor and city council for more plants in Stango Park or more plants at the library or whatever that's been denied and maybe I'm just not aware of it. I think it's, I'm sorry, finished Marty? Yeah, go ahead. I think it's pretty simple, you can do more. You know, you're not going to be able to do as much if, if you don't if if you don't have the donations. If you had, if Lewis and Boom Balloon had no donations, we'd have a lot lot less tulips. We'd have well, that's a where lot I'm. I don't know what more you want to do, and I don't want to sign up for putting signs anywhere until I know what the more is. We got a whole playground system without putting a single sign up. I mean, what else do you want? I mean, I don't want to sign up for putting signs anyplace unless I know for sure it's really needed. Well, let to answer Marty, for example, Lewis and Bloom does not get uh, any reimbursement for any of our plantings in, in Stango Park, uh, which includes the library, the beds that we are doing in front of the children's garden. Um, so uh, this would provide, say, more funding or let's say that the donation were a sponsor for Stango Park would provide funding for that. Uh, it would it provide funding for some of the things that Lewis and Bloom is doing and donating in, in other parks right now. But and oh, the city so more money for Lewis and Bloom. And the city is giving a donation to Lewis and Bloom. If we got sponsors, <laughs> for the parks, they could maybe do away with the, the donation. We wouldn't need to ask for a donation from the city. I don't know that I'm willing to ask Mayor and City Council to give up that money to Lewis and Blue in, order to, in return for signs. That's, that's where I'm going with this. And I still haven't heard anything that convinces me to tell you the truth. Warren, uh, how, much of your, how much of your budget is donation? donations and how much actually I don't get very many trees donated e each year very very few I how much I of the money that you spend on 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 Lewis and Bloom plant materials is 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 donated money I don't get any Lewis and Bloom materials I think the no, question I know, is but I'm asking Warren yeah what basically what would happen if you didn't have all that well we have the, the money for our plants comes from several sources. Um, well, I mean, we, we get reimbursement from most of the city for our plantings in most of the city parks. We have some sponsorships 
in other areas like the post office and the gateway garden. They do not cover everything that we do there. I mean, um, our other sources of, of revenue are fundraisers and donations in a normal year donations are not uh, a tremendous amount. Uh, our fundraisers cover most of the cost of, of the plantings. However, we have added, um, this past year we paid for all the tulips. Um, the chamber used to pay for them. Uh, we paid for them. And um, so, the, with donated money, huh? When you say we paid for them, where did the Lewis money come from? Bloom. Yes, from, from, from donations, money. right? Yes. And again, I would comment that that Lewis and Bloom put out a call for donations with the COVID situation, and it got an overwhelming response. And nobody asked that a single sign be put up in our city. So where's the need? That's that's still my question. Where's the need for another sign in our city? Well, Warren just said that the chamber did not pay for the tulips this year, right? I know, but... I don't know if they're gonna be able to pay for them anymore. I mean, I've, I've included some tul tulips in my parks budget, but still the, the tulips and fall bulbs are going to cost uh, probably over $10,000. And, uh, you know, we may have... Uh, we're probably going to have to come up with um, six or seven thousand dollars of that. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So I understand uh, if this were to happen, these donations would go towards Lewis and Bloom's contribution. No, they would go to the park, and okay. the park so commissioner would have the use of them. So it goes. Pardon, who has the use of them? Well, the, the park the park commissioner really would have the call of use of them. I mean, we would try. I, I think Lewis and Bloom would like to try to solicit the sponsors in areas where we would like to make improvements. So yeah, because I, I, I guess the question I'm having is well, I think Marty's asking, um, you know, is it really going to contribute to a major um, contra, contra, major contributions, more contributions to the park. And, and if, you, if you say, we'll put a sign up for, for $1,500. Okay, that's, that's one question. But the other question uh, I have is if the money is contributed, it goes to the city for a specific park. So in my case, someone would come and say, I want to contribute $1,500 for Canal Front Park. They would get a sign plate in Canal Front Park somewhere with That's their name on it. Yeah. And it. And it would go, and the money the, would go to the city. For, for use in that park. For use in that park. And then Lewis and Bloom would have to basically lobby for that money or a portion of that money to support Lewis and Bloom's efforts. That and if correct. we had if we had a big popular park where we had 10 con contributors, we would have 10 signs in various places in the park uh, that would stay there for two years. Is that the way I understand it? A sem semi-permanent or a permanent sign? What are we talking about here? I see two kinds of signs. Mm -hmm. it, it's left up to the discretion of the city. So in some cases, it could be a brick on the ground. It, you know, there are various mechanisms the city's used to acknowledge donations. I, I don't think we want more than one sponsor per park. Say that again. I, I would, I, I don't think we want more than one sponsor per park. Oh, okay. That's, that's well, see, then, then you're doing, then you're doing something that I've seen before. Uh, in other parts, Delaware Center for Horticulture does this in Wilmington, where they will identify an area and then they will offer it up for sponsorship. 
and they put a price tag on it. And it may be a different price tag depending on what where it is. It may be a, an entrance to the city with a huge intersection that needs to be planted, or it may be a strip down a street or a boulevard. And they put a price tag on it and they give the opportunity to private citizens or company, commercial um, um, entities to um, make the contribution. It doesn't say how much the contribution is on the study. And then everybody gets the same, you know, sponsored by Rodney Robinson Landscape Architects. And it gets put in that area and that's it. And, and it's done, I think every year or every five years, whatever they commit to for a sponsorship. And that's, that's one way to go about it because you're raising a specific amount of money. And in that case, it's for planting and maintenance. It's for mostly for maintenance uh, because they plant these things with ornamental grasses and bulbs and perennials and things that need tending. They need tending. And that's what the money goes to. And, it, it and Ronnie, goes, that budget, is that just coming straight off of this budget that they understand it costs X to take care of it? So the sponsorship costs... Yeah, and they and 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 uh, Preservation Delaware has that set up because they have a work program for people who come out of um, the um, um, the the what, the prison system, I guess you might call it, um, who you know who are looking for work and looking for training, and they train them in horticulture and to take care of them. They're out, you know, and these are these are good people who are looking for some some way to make a living and they're being trained um, and the money goes into training them and maintaining those uh, planted areas. So it's, a, it's quite a successful project. But what it takes is identifying all the areas, setting budgets for them, and then identifying that so that they can uh, recruit sponsors. A lot of the architectural engineering law firms uh, and other uh, other firms in in the city of Wilmington, you know, sponsor places like that. You go up uh, 52 out of Wilmington towards Greenville, and you'll see the center island is planted and maintained by, you know, a real estate company, something like that. So that's that's one way to go about it. I just I'm I'm I sympathize with Marty's concerns that um, you know we might end up with a lot of signs where um, we don't really want them, or there are people who are really making annual contributions that aren't recognized, um, and, and do we lose control of that? Because mm -hmm. once you start doing this, it's hard to stop. Right, that's one of my concerns. Yeah. We've had tremendous generosity out of both the business community and the, and the, and the private community, and I don't want people to start expecting a sign every time. And I'm all for recognizing people and their contributions. You just well, have to you know, when we did it for the for the you know for the um, for the um, playground, for instance, we had a photo op uh, uh, with the uh, bank that donated the last amount of money, and I think that photo wasn't that put in the Cape Gazette, and you know mm -hmm. things like that. We I'm happy with. Mm -hmm. happy with. Sure, it's important. We, we have had um, in my short tenure, a few, several donations from citizens to the Parks and Rec Commission to use at the discretion. So, and they're not asking for a sign or anything. It's certainly not $1,500, um, but there is a, a, a letter format thanking them for their donation and the opportunity to help others enjoy the parks throughout the city. So there's there's a, a mechanism in place. It's not specifically for one organization that works in the park systems to, you know, specifically benefit. And that might be the way to do it if, you know, there was specific need in a specific park that if it were Stango Park, um, you know, Candace could come and say, you know, we're doing plantings in Candace in, in Stango Park and 
how much do we have in donations? We're anticipating that it would be this much and then do it, do it that way. The, the other thing is that people tend to respond if they know what their contribution is being directed towards. This if is you true. Just, if you just give it to the city, I think people might think twice about it. So if, if uh, Warren, you said, you know, we're only going to ask for one contribution per park, uh, then you should tell them what's, what's going to happen. And, and maybe it all goes to, um, to uh, Lewis and Bloom. I mean, I, you know, I think people ought to know that it's, it's targeted towards some improvement. I mean, if you're going to fix, half of it goes to tulips, but the other half goes uh, to fixing catch basins, um, you, you know, people are going to be less likely to contribute to that because they'll say, you know, well, um, infrastructure is what the city should be taking care of, you know. Um, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll buy the tulips, you, you put the drainage system in. So that's, you're going to get greater success out of that. And then, and then a couple of other things I noticed, and I'll shut up. Um, but it's um, it's 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 a little vague when you say throughout the life of the plaque. Um, you know, okay, I want a concrete plaque. It's going to be there a long time. I mean, it's 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 too vague. And I think I think you need to let people know um, how long the plaque is. And if you have if a plaque lasts five years, and you have different groups of people contributing every year. Uh, you're going to that same, that, that's the way yeah, I interpret that. That same phrase is used for both the semi-permanent sign and the permanent sign. And right. I had thought at one point the semi-permanent sign, um, I would think of it as a, I, I, I had assumed that would be cover things like maybe the annuals this year in bed X and right. it only lasts a year and maybe you only need a sign up for a year if we have a policy. Um, a permanent sign would be something a more permanent kind of um, planting or structure or something, hardscaping, something like that to improve the garden or something like that. But yeah, um, for example, we're talking about in the future, maybe putting in an accessible path from the parking area uh, across Canal Front Park to the big center gazebo out there because people want to have events out there like a wedding or something and they can't get uh, people in wheelchairs there very easily. So that's a project, that's a capital improvement project. And in that case, you know, you might go and advertise it and ask for, uh, I mean, that's what they did. There's a, there's a uh, pavilion out on the end of the dock, which the Baker family all chipped in and supported, it. And they got a nice permanent plaque out. And they're very proud of that. And I know, cause I know them. And they also um, were very, very happy to have a, find a way where they could contribute to the park. So some of these things ought to be carefully targeted, like the, like the playgrounds, and recognize people for it. But you can't be too vague about it. Although I'm not, I'm not against this idea, Warren. I think, I think we just have to make sure we know what we're doing, find a way to in, in, institute it. I'm done. <laughs> Are there any other? I did, I did read the memo. <laughs> I know. Um, any other comments? Yeah, I would I just have... say okay. that. Go ahead, Barry. I would just say that when Candace and Warren and I came up with some of these guidelines, it was an attempt to control and structure the donating donation process. And so I think that's what the intent was. I'm not sure that we have it structured specifically or enough, um, but I think if we have a framework where we can continue to specify or structure it like Rodney outlined, you know, so much for this part for this gardener, for whatever it is, um, that, you know, that, that, I mean, I think that's what the intent of those guidelines were, was to structure it and to control, control it. Uh, mm -hmm. We already do do sponsors. You already do that with trees and benches and everything. And so I think we're talking about expanding that 
controlling it. So that, I think that's, that's exactly the right of the guidelines. That's exactly right. To 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 do a tree, there's a price for it, and you get a you get a a, a recognition. To do a bench, there's a price. You get a recognition. Mm -hmm. so I, think, I think this thing just needs to be taken a little bit farther so that it's not as vague. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll uh, take it back to committee and we'll continue to work and incorporate the observations and comments and bring it back when we have another iteration of a draft. Okay, so I don't think we need a motion. We're just going to table and take it back to the subcommittee. Okay. Okay. Um, so our next agenda item under new business E1 is presentation discussion and possible action on Art in Bloom's proposal to place mosaic art pieces in the Butterfly Garden at Canal Front Park and the Pollinator Garden at George H.P. Smith Park. We have with us Sue Sandmeyer from Art in Bloom. And Sue, I'm gonna bring you up um, so that you can speak and I, I just, I'm having trouble with my um, Zoom. My, my screen keeps bouncing off. So I'm gonna try and bring you in soon. Um, if you just give me a moment, because every time I go off the screen, I lose, I, it's taking me to another screen. I'm just going to close that. There you are. Okay. My technology is working. So Janet, I I don't see Sue on my screen. Is that? Um. Yeah. No, you won't. I'm promoting Sue to a panelist, so oh. she'll come in. Okay. Um, oh, there you are. <laughs> oh, Sue. You have an S, you don't have your. Yeah. You don't have your see you. <laughs> we see a big S where you are. <laughs> so, Sue, you are muted. If you could unmute. Okay. I believe I have unmuted. You're unmuted. Um, so, I have attached to the agenda the proposal. Um, and Sue, if you would like to go ahead and um, review the proposal with the commissioners and what your vision is, your request. Could she open her video? Can you open video, Sue? Um, I, when I say start video and I click on it, nothing happens. Oh, wait. There it is. There you oh. go. You need a little more light, though. Yeah. Yep. You're, you're in the shadows. Exactly. You're, you're in the witness protection program. <laughs> Is that any better? Yes. Yeah. A little bit. Great. Welcome, Sue. Thank you Thank for you. joining us. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate your time and consideration this evening. Um, just a very brief note about me so that you know why I'm the person that's here talking to you. I've been a member of Lewis and Bloom for about eight years now, and I've had a variety of leadership roles with Lewis and Bloom. My most uh, current role is co-chair of Art and Bloom. And um, my most recent role with Art and Bloom was to oversee the mosaic mural on the Lewis drawbridge. Very, well, very good, by the way. Beautiful. Oh, thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you very much. It was a labor of love and uh, 50 volunteers from Lewis and Bloom did this. So, so it was quite the a successful community uh, public art project. Um, I have two goals for this presentation. Um, and one, and I'm open to questions or comments at any time. But my first goal is to describe the type of public art that we would like to place in the two Lewis uh, parks, which also have gardens that are maintained by Lewis and Bloom. 
And then the other goal is to request and hopefully, hopefully receive your permission to place the art in the Canal Front Butterfly Garden and the H.P. Smith Pollinator Garden. Um, <clears throat> so just a little bit of background. I'm sure that you read um, the material that was provided also, so I don't want to keep repeating things. But um, four local mosaic artists, including myself, um, approached Lewis and Bloom about creating mosaic panels for these gardens. And the Board of Advisors of Lewis and Bloom approved funding for the project. And the funding would pay for the materials only. The design and the creation of the art would be donated by the artist. The, the murals themselves would be created out of stained glass and glass tiles, and none of the art panels would be larger than 24 by 36 inches. And um, the mosaics, uh, the species, will be native to Delaware among those depicted. They'd include tiger swallowtail, which is a state butterfly, monarch, bees, and other pollinators. And the way that we're envisioning this is that the art would also be somewhat educational by adding small, small signs <laughs> with each piece that lists the artist, description of the insect, and vision of, the, the, of what was behind the design. And as I mentioned before, the art panels would not, would be set, would not be any larger than 24 by 36 inches. And they would be secured by a wood or a metal pole um, that was, would be set in a, a concrete footer approximately six inches wide and 18 inches deep in the ground. This would secure them in the wind and um, also uh, from being easily pulled out of the ground by an admirer. Um, so why don't I stop for the moment and see if there's any questions or comments? Could you one, one, one where they would be, which gardens, which gardens they would be in? George H. P. Smith and the Canal Front Butterfly Garden. So, so only only those two gardens. Well, um, we'd also like to be at um, the uh, Citizens Bank, but I, I we we don't have an answer yet from them. And if they are not able to, I would like to be able to go into another Lewis Garden. Okay, thanks. Is, is it one ceramic panel per garden? Yes. Um, for the pollinator garden, we are also thinking about putting two together, of uh, pollinators uh, native to Delaware. At Lewis Canal? Uh, no, this would be at the George H.P. Smith pollinator garden. Okay. Okay. So you're talking four all together? Correct. Okay. Thank you. I have a question. This is maybe for Barry, actually. Is this something that you think should go before the Public Arts Committee or? I, I understand, yeah, it would have to. Anything that's done on, on public, um, the City of Lewis um, property has to be um, run through the uh, Public Art Commission. Even if it's in a Lewis and Bloom garden and it's enhancing the garden more than... It's it's public, it's, it's, it's city property. Anything that's on city property, that, that's, what, that's why the, the city commission was created, I understand. I mean, the, the Menhaden, that's private property, the Citizens Bank, is private property. Um, I, I certainly can be presented, I think, here, and uh, Rec and Parks can comment to uh, the Public Art Commission. But I mean, that's that's why the commissioners set it up this way. I, I believe, isn't that correct, Andrew? That's why I was asking. I didn't know if the, to her point was the purview, like if that's crossed over from the of yeah, I don't, yeah, uh, this is the first time I've, I've heard of it so I mean the yeah. our the, the city charter I've never mm -hmm. seen the charter but do they does the public art commission have the exclusive authority yes the, that's why it was set up it was set up to promote public art but I don't remember it they were the only ones that could no, do it. no well, that's why I, I have to read it. I don't know. I'd have to read. That's it. why it was set up. That's what. That's what I was told when I was asked to be. It was. It was on it was, on the group. Otherwise, anybody can just 
approach any park, any group can just, there's well, no- I, I, I think it's, it's good to start the discussion here so sure. that the commissioners for the two designated parks can consider and if it's even something that they want to have in the park and then take it to, we would make a recommendation to take it to the public art committee and have them look at it. But it, they, they are city parks and even though it's Lewis and Bloom, it's within the city park and that's public lands. So I think it warrants further discussion here and then it could go to the public art committee. And I think they're meeting next week, right, Barry? Yes. So I know that agenda's <clears throat> already out, I believe. So it might have to wait until next month's meeting. Let me see, I think, uh... that meeting's yeah, the 20, yeah. that meeting's the 27th. So you could get it on I could, we could get it on if there's discussion yeah. for tonight. Ed, you had a uh, uh, if, question if, or comment? If we were to make a sign to a designating sign for George H.P. Smith Park, and it was artistic in nature and made with stained glass or whatever medium you decided on, we as commissioners could decide to put a sign, I, 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 I know we're, you know, everybody's got these jurisdictional issues, but every time that we wanna do something that could be considered artistic, we would have to go through the artistic. Oh, the, the, they they, they even looked at the, the Veterans Memorial went through the Public Arts Committee. Right. Is it public So art? maybe, there, we, we, public maybe art. we just have the horse before the cart here, you know? It's a procedural issue, maybe more than you know who decides. I think why. so. I, I think that um, the reason the public it, art commission was created in right. the city is so that there was one group that Shepherd did the the public art in the public spaces. Otherwise, you're having five, six Lewis and Bloom uh artists collaborative all going to the city council and getting projects approved so that's why i understand that the public art commission was created so it, it's me, a flow issue more is than backwards yes it, it that 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 probably is correct well is is this really garden art or is this garden decoration it's public I mean, art. I mean, you don't want to say it. It's a public art. I mean, there's no, I don't think there's any way to, it's not a sign. It's public art. That's, that's Rodney, what the commission was created for. To Rodney, shepherd through these different proposals. Okay. And create their own. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I see you can certainly make the argument that it's public art. It's not been described as an interpretive panel, for example although it has an educational purpose, um, it is a piece of art. And so I think it makes sense to let the art commission, you know, maybe have the ultimate decision to recommend the, the piece to the city. And what I don't see in the proposal is any review process. Mm -hmm. It seems like uh, the artists can pretty much do what they want. And I think maybe, a good way to go might be to run it past us in this meeting and see if there are any objections to the concept of doing mm -hmm. this. I'll say I have no objection. I think it's a very interesting idea and a, and a good idea. <clears throat> if we agree that it's a good idea, then I think it should go to the Art Commission uh, for their approval. And I would like to have them review a, the sketches by the artist as opposed to just saying, yeah, we'll see what you come up with. I mean, I think in every, in every kind of situation like this that I've ever been involved in, there's, a, there's a, a process where the artist comes back with a sketch and a concept so that uh, the organization can review it and approve it. I would recommend that. 
I mean, this is a totally different situation than the Manhattan thing or the uh, the bridge. So what, Barry, what are you saying? Ben? I'm saying the whole thing's backwards. Uh, if, if, if we create, I mean, if we create a, a, a public art commission, then that's what it's for, okay. is to look oh, at public exactly. art and, and, and shepherd through that process. I mean, we, we wouldn't. Well, but I, I think what Rodney said makes sense though. I, what Rodney said makes right. a lot of sense, which is sure. if it's not a, if it's a non-starter in the parks, then it's a non-starter right. with the, with the public arts committee. So I, I, I agree with what Rodney said. Yeah, I, I don't know which comes first, but I think, I think it makes sense to come to Parks and Rec first, perhaps, because yeah, as, as he said, if we thought it was a terrible idea for our garden, then I think we should say so now. I personally think it's a great idea for our gardens. And if it has to go through public art committee, that's fine, let's get it on to the next step. Um, but do we need a motion to approve it for? Well, I you think- know, I yeah. actually think that way might help the process and going next step to the public arts is saying that if right. you all think it's a good idea, that, that kind of endorses it. Right. I, I think it's um, it's valid to have a motion if, if, if everybody's in agreement after discussion to move forward to make the motion to send, you know, the request to the public art committee for review. I would like to make that motion that we accept this proposal. Uh, and that uh, we would like the proposal to be taken to the Public Art Commission for their review. I will second that motion. Can Thank I you. Ask a question here. It, to say yes. that we accept it, what does that mean? It means we don't object to this proposal that they accept it in they, concept. In concept, we have we haven't. I haven't seen anything. I don't know what it looks like. It has a description of the size, which is important to me. Um, but as far as the artwork is concerned. I don't think that's my purview to decide what I like and what I don't. I would, I would really like the art uh, commission to weigh in on that. And I think if they, if they accept it, they can go to the city and say, and we have the, the support of the, of the parks and recreation commissioners sure. on this also. As my understanding, the public arts commission ha has a gatekeeper role mm -hmm. based on an incident from many years ago where there was racy art put up in one of the parks so that this commission has a kind of broad and kind of hard to define um, task of deciding it's appropriate and it's very helpful. So I think if this commission decides in concept, this is good, forwards it on and then the public arts commission can further refine it and work to make sure that it fits in the scope. I think that makes sense. Thank you, Kay. Sue, you have? I have a question about PAC. When you say um, to go to take it to PAC for review, does that mean that they approve the piece of artwork? Do they say, well, maybe instead of a monarch, you should have a, a tiger swallowtail? I mean, what level of granularity will they get into in, in terms of determining what should be seen? I don't think that's defined. I mean, if you look, I mean, we, we all probably ought to look at um, the guidelines that were set up. Uh, I don't have them handy, but it, it, it outlines what the purpose of the Public Art Commission is, and it outlines the duties and all, all, all that. And I think even myself, I don't have them right in front of me, so I, I, I can't tell you uh, what they are, but I think if we all, uh, maybe Janet, uh, you could get a copy of that and share that with us, um, mm -hmm. because I, I, I think that'll clear up understanding, um, the misunderstanding here uh, of what the purpose of the public art, I mean, it, to me, it, it, that's why these commissions are set up. I mean, you wouldn't, you know, try to set up a playground somewhere without going through the, the, the Recreation and Parks Commission. So mm -hmm. I think it's sort of the same thing. That, that's how I 
I see it. I was just trying to better understand what review means. Well, I, again, I would say look at the guidelines. It, it, it's, it spells all that out. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, well, there I, is I, a reason that the city created this commission. I think this is a little, bit, outlined. a little bit different too, Barry, because the, the, the things that, that have been reviewed by the public art committee were, they were looking for um, installations or public art where then the art in bloom is coming to them with a conceptual idea and building on that. So I think, Sue, it might be helpful if you have a little bit more of a rendering to kind of show to 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 present to the public art committee um, so that they have something a little bit more detailed to look at and to review and I don't know if that you know a conceptual drawing perhaps mm -hmm. color schemes that sort of thing there was a drawing attached to what I sent you at the right. bottom yeah. so you want color that you think they would want color I think I think they'd want a little bit more detail. Do you can I just say I would let them speak for themselves. I mean, <clears throat> what you've presented us with in the first sentence is to approve the creation and funding of a series of beautiful mosaic art pieces. Art pieces. To me, that puts it into the art commission. And all I'm saying is. I think it's a great idea. I think you should pursue it. I have no objection to having it in the in the uh, a butterfly garden or the pollinator garden, um, and go to the art commission with it. And I and I recommend. I like the sketch, but I recommend uh, that you do you have the artists come up with the sketches and and present them. I wouldn't just say we're going to do this thing. Do you approve it? And I, if I were on a commission, I'd say, and what is it? Mm -hmm. um, I would want to know. And as they should, that's their job, and um, and let them respond to it. It doesn't have to be. If it has to be a finished rendering of it, that's their that's their decision. But but take it to them and have them review the concept and what you're talking about and the size, and the materials and the image. I think I think that would all be. I'd be surprised if you got had any uh, objection to it. Frankly. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rodney. Harry. Will we have a chance to do a, a final yay or nay or make some suggestions about this? Or is it just going to, we're just agreeing blindly to let someone else decide and, and that's that? No, I think there would, there would definitely be some coordination between the part. I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons I'm on the, they put me on the, the art commission so that I could be a liaison between the the two, um, but I, I, I would expect that we would have some coordination and dialogue between the two. I, I don't think the park, the art commission is going to say, we're going to put this in your park. No, that's, that's not, that's not how it works, but, but how it was intended to work. I'm, I'm not trying to judge the art. Uh, I'm not, no. that, that's not my, my, but our pollinator garden is very bare and naked out of season, which means it's just starting to grow right now and it will be lush through the fall, but then it goes very bare and a piece of art on a stick, and I don't mean to be rude about this, is gonna be, it's gonna be a bare naked thing unless I could go back to the pollinator garden people, I'm part of that, that, that working group and say, let's put some, um, perennials, but let's put some evergreens. Let's put something around it so that it doesn't sit bare naked in the middle of a brown area for half the year. Uh, it would just be suggestions on how it would look better in our park. Yeah, I mean, that would be part of the coordination, I would think. Just, just if, if and when it's approved. Yeah, and but we have to make sure we don't discourage the artists who are willing to put this time and effort and creativity into this to make our park look better and be a little more meaningful 
<clears throat> so I don't want to have them to have to go through a phalanx of cr critics. Um, uh, you know, as Barry said, comment coordination is good. Well, the other th I don't I don't think they need my approval. Well, the other comment. thing that reason they created also is they didn't want the city council to decide what public art was accepted. Right. You, you don't have a bunch of commissioners deciding what, you know, it doesn't, yeah. you have people that are involved in the field that, you know, just like we're involved in parks and rec. So they send stuff to us. Well, let me just get put it to the point. We just had an installation done at Canal Front Park. They didn't ask me or any of us whether we liked it or not. They really don't have to. The question is, is it appropriate to do something like that? And I think we all agreed yes, and that's a good place for it. Now let them do their job and work with the artist. Th that's the way I look at it. Okay. Yeah, we looked at we looked at like 10 pieces of art. Right, right. You know, it was a and, process. We didn't just say, hey, let's, you know. And my comment was, figure out a way that people don't walk off with the art or people don't climb on it and get hurt. That's what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in um, deciding what the artwork is. I, I think you let the artist, you have to give the artist a certain amount of freedom here. And, and it's, it's up to the um, art commission to work that out. That's my view. Okay. Are there any other comments, discussion? Andrew? <laughs> I would just say, if, Sue, I, I, I saw your sketch and it made, uh, if you want to get on the agenda, that might actually be a good starting spot, as uh, Ronnie said, just to say, if there's going to get any feedback, better to have, you know, sort of as a, as a sketch process anyway, I would assume. But uh, let me know. We'll get it on the agenda for the 27th. That, it's more than seven days out, so we can get it, keep the process going this way. I don't think that uh, we'd be able to fully develop renderings um, within a week of, of all the ideas that are that we have. Okay. Well, present what you have then. So I was wondering if you just want to present the sketch as a concept of where you're going forward and just, I mean, like he said, like Barry said, it may be, a, it may be very simple, just, yeah, we like the idea. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'd like to get on that agenda. Okay. Okay. And Janet, can you, can you make sure that gets on the yeah, public I, agenda? Yeah, I'll talk to Janine tomorrow and um, I'll let, I'll let Cliff know too. So I'll just, um, Sue, we'll just attach what you have for tonight's meeting to the okay. agenda. Perfect. And then- it's official, we can... don't we need to vote on the motion? Oh, but sorry. I know, I am, but we're still discussion. Does, <laughs> that... you're talking about... <laughs> well, no, I yeah, I know you're right, but- Sorry Ed, about that. Ed, Ed had something. That's where we're all going, so okay. Ed had something to to say. Yeah, I don't know how you know procedurally how we have to move forward, but I don't want to delay it back and forth. I feel comfortable leaving it up. You know, if we decide we 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 like the concept, leaving it up to the experts in the arts world. I'm per me I me personally, I am perfectly comfortable with letting them say here it is and we'll put it in the park. Okay. Any other comments, discussion? Okay, there, Marty. Oh. Was there a second to my motion? Yes, there was. Um, we have a motion from Rodney to accept the proposal uh, for the uh, art mosaics, the mosaic art in the parks and to um, move that to the Public Art Committee for review. And we had a second by Ed. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I'm Aye. abstaining because of procedural uh, issues. Okay, thank you, Barry. Any opposed? Okay, so the motion carries with... Uh, Used. Okay. That 
I think is the longest meeting that we've had since I've been in the position. Um, I was getting kudos for quite a while that the meetings were quick. So <laughs> um, that, that has carried us through the agenda. So is there a motion to adjourn for this evening? So moved. <laughs> I second. Okay, thank you. We had a second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, All right. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see thank you next you week. Too. Okay. Thank okay. you, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you.